Hello and welcome back to Biomes, the place to learn about the latest fascinating developments in human microbiome research and to get a full dose of microbes in your ears. You actually have a lot of bacteria in your ears, would you believe? And some evidence shows that if you acquire or lack some of these microbes, this can lead to ear infections, mainly in children. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. This third or fourth episode of the series is actually all about cancer, particularly cancer in the lower intestine, known as bowel cancer or colorectal cancer, depending on where you are in the world. And as you might have guessed from the theme of the podcast, there are some significant links between the types of microbes in your intestine and your risk of developing colorectal cancer by either causing or preventing certain cells in the gut to change and become cancerous. Uh, In fact, tumours have their own microbiomes and the microbes that they contain may control how much that that tumour grows and spreads. And if that wasn't enough, recent evidence shows that combining therapies that target the gut microbiome with traditional therapies can improve the efficacy of certain cancer treatments. This week, I speak to one of the leading figures in this field, Professor Wendy Garrett of Harvard Medical School. Professor Garrett is both a medical doctor treating cancer patients and a researcher examining the processes by which gut microbes cause and prevent colorectal cancer. Her work has shown fascinating links between microbes that originate in the mouth and how they travel to the gut and may contribute to colorectal cancer. We discuss this exciting research and the future for targeting the gut microbiome as an approach to tackle colorectal cancer. And as always, this episode of the second season of Biomes is sponsored by Microbiome Insights. The team at Microbiome Insights have partnered with some of the world's leading cancer research institutes, helping researchers incorporate microbiome sequencing and analysis to their clinical studies. You can get a free study consultation from the team at Microbiome Insights. So head over to microbiomeinsights.com to find out more and tell them you were listening to the podcast. Thank you very much, Professor Wendy Garrett, for agreeing to have a chat um, in these crazy COVID times when everyone's connected by, by Zoom. But it's great to, to connect and hear about your, uh, your work um, as a kind of leading figure, I suppose, in uh, in the gut microbiome, especially in your speciality, looking at how the gut microbiome is associated with colorectal cancer and also, uh, you know, inflammation in, in the colon. Uh, you look at a bit at IBD as well, which is, um, we'll chat about all these, all these different things, but maybe we can start off and just hear about your career and how you got to where you are today. You're a, an MD as well as a, a scientist. Um, so how did you get to where you are and how did you become interested in the, in the microbiome field? Sure. So as you said, I'm a physician scientist. Clinically, I'm a medical oncologist uh, with subspecialty training and interest in gastrointestinal malignancies. And you're right, bowel cancer or colorectal cancer is my clinical passion. Um, and you also said I'm also a, a scientist. And uh, I have been interested in the immune system and bacteria for a very long time since graduate school. And it was fantastic to see a field uh, coalesce that's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, So like many of the people in this series, I am a microbiome study scientist or researcher advocate. (laughs) And as anyone that's listening knows, that's the collection of organisms, not only that live within and on the human body, but are, you know, on our furry pets, let's see, <laughs> uh, on our furniture, in our built environment. And um, I'm very interested in how those sort of exposures shape our uh, immune development uh, and shape our susceptibility or resistance to disease. Um, I was growing bacteria in my basement home in 
middle school. I no think way. I had potatoes, and um, that might have been more mycobiome or fungal elements of our uh, world. But it's been a long time uh, that I've been interested in science since I was, you know, a kid or a wee one. Um, and so uh, I definitely think all of us that are in science should work to promote uh, science and technology and interest in engineering and, and mathematics um, from the earliest ages, from preschool uh, on up. So um, youth can have and develop curiosity about the living world which is really what microbiome studies is all about. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. You're doing it from uh, from your time as a kid as well, growing growing microbes. And in your in your medical training, was there any? I mean, I know we kind of learn from the basic science, you know, that microbes cause disease. But was there any appreciation back when you were doing medical training for the microbiome field and this this greater appreciation of the microbiome as a whole as a kind of major regulator of all these things we now know it, it, it plays a role in the body or was it always the kind of uh, microbe disease model that you learned about? Well, we didn't use the word microbiome when I was in med school many years ago, but we definitely had some infections that you've probably covered in your podcast, one of those being Clostridium difficile. And I did hear about stool transplants in medical school. And I right. thought the idea was wild and fascinating. And um, so we were talking in some fashion. There was an idea that even though we might study model organisms in the lab, like salmonella, that there was more complexity in the gastrointestinal tract. And within mammals, the uh, number of organisms that a particular host was um, serving as a home uh, for microbes. Uh, so yeah, I think there was some uh, understanding and appreciation. Now it's much more explicit. Yeah. Um, so through the Harvard Chan Center and um, Microbiome and Public Health, we're teaching uh, masters in public health students, and we're teaching medical students, and we're teaching our graduate students in immunology and biomedical sciences about this sort of more ecological think to the human organism and also model organisms that we study. Yeah. and how the microbiome can inform so many different physiological processes. Great. Cell growth, you know, et cetera. So it's making its way into the medical curriculum and, and public health curriculum. That's, that's great to hear. Um, so you, as you mentioned, your kind of speciality is uh, bowel cancer and colorectal cancers. And you've done a lot of work in, I suppose, the immunology and the microbiology uh, behind that. So maybe we'll just kind of have a brief... I suppose background is if you're kind of given a presentation about the kind of epidemiology, I suppose, of, of colorectal cancer, are rates increasing around the world? What's the kind of, what are the big stats uh, with, with colorectal cancer that, that make it such an important disease to study for you? Well, sort of across the globe, it's the third leading cause of cancer related mortality. And I know in the UK, you call it bowel cancer. In the US, we call it colorectal cancer. And there's differences in the disease in terms of where it sort of pops up in the right colon or the transverse colon or the left colon or the sigmoid colon or the rectum, that most distal sort of part of the colon. Um, so, you know, the, the experts sort of obsess about that geography of it. Um, the other piece that's very concerning is that with the change in dietary patterns across the world, we're seeing an increased incidence in countries that were historically had low levels of it. So countries like the People's Republic of China are having much higher increased risk. We're seeing some tickle of increase in the, you know, the larger African continent, of course, mm. many, many countries there. Uh, so that's concerning. The other place where we're seeing a very concerning epidemiological trend is with this idea of young onset colorectal cancer. Right. And it's really inexplicable in some ways. Sometimes there are genetic syndromes or there might be patterns in families. And we have names for those syndromes, the Lid syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer or um, adenomatous polyposis coli gene is involved in familial adenomatous polyposis. But these young people, people in their 20s and 30s, people younger than 50 that are de developing colon cancer often don't fit that pattern. Really? And right. it isn't some clear signal like obesity. No, it's not that at all. And so that is a very concerning trend, seeing this disease creep up and pop up in younger and younger populations. And 
One big reason is why, why are we seeing it in younger, younger populations? As in someone microbiome studies own my bias, we're wondering if it's some sort of um, trend in the microbiome or some sort of pattern there or something popping up there with an environmental exposure related to the microbiome. So definitely young onset colorectal cancer and seeing sort of different trends in emerging or developing nations in terms of increased rates of colorectal cancer, big con bit concerning, very concerning. Right. So that's sort of the epidemiology, I think. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot to it, I guess. And I, we, I will kind of go into detail a bit about your work specifically and fusobacteria, but give us a little kind of insight into what were the first discoveries in terms of how the microbiome may uh, be associated with um, colorectal cancer? I mean, it, it might seem obvious now we think about it, the, the intestinal environment, particularly the large intestine is full of the, these bacteria, viruses, everything. And so it's safe to hypothesize or, or assume that they may play a role in you know, cells uh, mutating and changing differently lead, leading to cancer. So what was the kind of first signs of this or evidence that kind of changes in the gut microbiome may be associated with um, colorectal cancer? So it goes way back. So even when I was in med school, I was learning sort of this pearl that I still tell, or this little gem or nugget of knowledge that we still teach our students, that there's some organisms that can be found in the blood and they shouldn't be there. It's an infection or a bacteremia. And sometimes there's streptococci, streptococcus or streptococci. One of them is now called streptococcus gallolyticus. It used to be called historically streptococcus bovis. And if you saw that bacteremia, that infection in the blood, you needed to order that patient a colonoscopy because there was an association or a correlation with the presence of an adenoma, a tumor in the colon or frank colon cancer. And so, that was known for many, many, many decades before I even came to uh, medical school. So hearing about that and learning about that in medical school and seeing those case reports and series and uh, collections or small cohorts of patients, that definitely um, put that tickle early on or that psychic itch in my head um, during my medical education of hmm, what were the legs? Mm. You know, it intuitively makes sense that as you noted, the colon is the most densely populated microbial ecosystem. Why wouldn't the microbes there have play a role. Uh, but it was this sort of ops, clinical observations that planted the seed for me. That's great. And, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Usually what happens, isn't it? It's these kind of strange clinical observations that lead to the kind of broader questions. And I think that's yeah. what's exciting about your role, uh, kind of being on that fence of being a clinician and a, and a scientist as well. It allows you to kind of lead those kind of observations, discoveries down a, a kind of detailed route in, in science. I think that's... It's such a fortunate great. path, the path of the physician scientist. I think it also speaks to, while it's wonderful that some people are able to invest the time and have the opportunity, um, it's, it's a position and an educational path of privilege. Um, and so I own that privilege and I'm very grateful for it, but it means that doctors and scientists um, need to talk. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes there are patterns and observations that can, only if you have a particular maybe training or kind of think might that bubble up to a thought and really make an impact in terms of uncovering biology and ultimately yeah, helping patients. So you're right. talk to people over Zoom or at conferences. So um, those sort of nascent ideas and observations that other people had made really inspired me to sort of ask those basic research questions. And then there was this sort of emergence, right, of mm. microbiome sciences and an emergence of applying sequencing technology that came, you know, out of um, the Human Genome Project and the hard work of many folks applying sort of sequencing technology to looking at microbes. Um, yeah. And so we could begin to look at microbes at a larger scale using different technologies in human stool and look for trends with the emergence of uh, uh, or diagnoses of polyps or cancers, we could look, begin to look at the tissues too. And when I see this is a, a field of many researchers, it's not just one lab, uh, yeah. and begin to look at those tissues and see what were the resident microbes in those tissues. And uh, not surprisingly, certain patterns popped up. And one of those patterns or signals or features um, was sequence of uh, an organism that you already mentioned, Fusobacterium nucleatum. And these are sort of beautiful, long gram negative rods that guess what? You and I probably both have, but guess what? They live here at our gingival crevice, uh, along our buccal mucosa, the inside of our cheek on our tongue. And 
There's a huge literature generated by the oral microbiologists about their role in plaque and gingivitis. A lot of us have them do okay with them. And so when a couple labs, the Myerson lab that I've been collaborating with for many years and the Holt lab started to see those in colon tumor samples, it was kind of puzzling. What is an oral bug, right? A mouth associated microbe that you and I have doing in a colon tumor sample or a colon cancer sample. These weren't just samples from one site in Canada or one site in Boston. These were samples from Germany and Spain and Vietnam. These are truly global samples. So then, you know, you're always worried. Did someone spit in the sample? <laughs> Could happen, right? Well, you can use other sequence, the other technologies besides sequencing. You can use different kinds of sequencing. You can try to grow the organism. And what was borne out was that some colon tumors uh, in terms of the microbial or bacterial sequences were there were dominated by fusobacteria. 60% 60 of the microbial or bacterial reads were mapping to this fusobacterium nucleatum. Wow. Um, and when you looked at larger populations, sometimes depending on the collection of patients, 11 to maybe 70% of the patients using PCR-based technologies had sort of some of this fuso DNA. That was unbelievable. Mm. So again, that's correlation, but it generates a whole bunch of questions. How does it get there? Is it just a bystander or is it a driver of some behavior? What about a tumor enables it to be a host for a fuso? What about fuso enables it to leave the mouth, its normal or native niche in a human and get to the tumor? And is it of consequence? Right? Is it a bad thing? So then you get lots of folks involved. You get molecular epidemiologists involved that have access to lots of human tissues. They can do, and, and um, clinician scientists then do, can do correlations with survival and yeah. response to disease. Yeah. You get microbiologists that want to look at all the genomes of all the different fusobacterium nucleatum species and, and figure out what's different and how similar are fuso in the mouth and the tumor. You get the immunologists, right? That like to pull apart the tumor microenvironment or gut tissues and asks how to, where is fuso? How does it interact with different immune cells? Does it draw more immune cells in? Does it affect anti-tumor immunity? And you sort of explode a field because you make this observation yeah. and uh, it's not solved yet. And guess what? <laughs> Fusos, fusonucleatum isn't the only bug enriched in tumor tissues. There are polyketide synthase or PKS pathogenicity island harboring Escherichia coli, PKS positive E. coli. Uh, and that island can harbor several genes that result in the elaboration of a toxin that we sort of colloquially call colibactin yeah. that can damage DNA. So then you get chemical biologists and classic bacteriologists involved and stem cell biologists and immunologists trying to figure out and cancer genomicists how that toxin bond, gets out of the bacteria, is processed, damages the DNA then, you know, you get the people to think about why did it evolve that not to cause cancer, right? Probably to fight other bacteria and, and win the war of, you know, occupying a niche. Um, so you've got PKS positive E. coli. You have this super cool bug that a few labs, especially Cindy Sears's lab has studied called enterotoxic, uh, enterotoxigenic bacteroides fraudulus. Mm. So um, there are certain toxin producing bacteroides that some people have, and those are enriched in some colon tumors and polyps. Wow. So maybe we can, we can kind of explore some of those, uh, a yeah. little bit more, particularly the, the fusobacteria, because I think that's a really interesting one, how it originates in the mouth. We all have it, as you say, on, you know, most people will have it somewhere. So what is it? Why, why does it move? Or what do we know about the causality? Is it moving down and causing cancer? Or is something happening in the environment or happening in our, you know, mouths or our bloodstream that is just allowing it to, to pass down? Um, what, what have you and what have others found out about that? And why does it pass from the mouth to the gut uh, if, if it does do that? So we've asked those questions and uh, in my lab and collaborative with other labs, like the lab of Gilad Bahra in Israel at Hebrew University, Hadassah Hospital, and also with the Curtis Huttenhauer's lab. So there are a couple ways. So just sit there for a minute. You have saliva in your mouth. Guess what? You're going to, you're going to swallow some. 
So um, how do you interrogate questions about how do mouth bacteria end up in your colon? Are they biologically active? Are they transcribed? So you can do that. You can ask within an individual how similar are mouth bacteria and then bacteria in the colon by looking at spit samples or tongue samples and fecal samples. And guess what? It's a minority of the organisms that are transcriptionally active, both in the mouth and in the colon, or colon resident bacteria that end up active in the mouth. So hmm, it's not a usual thing. There are some, but not many that can do that. You can also ask generic questions about how common is Fusobacterium nucleatum in the stool of a healthy person? Guess what? Not really that common. It likes to live in the mouth. So that you can say, why is it so good at living in the mouth? And that's because it's got a lot of adhesins, we think, uh, sticky proteins, we know it has those, and it binds to uh, other bacteria. And you know, that's really, a, uh, helps to construct that biofilm that we all call plaque. So Fuso is good, we know generally a feature of Fuso is it's good, it's sticking to other bacteria and some things or tissues. So what's another thing you do maybe at least twice a day, I hope? Brush your teeth, I think is what you're gonna say. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've talked a lot about Gilly Bachrock about this. So he's an oral microbiologist. So you brush your teeth and I'm sure you have impeccable dental hygiene, but occasionally, right? Maybe you're flossing your teeth and brushing them. And what do you notice when you spit? Your spit is a little bit, red or pink tinged, right? That's a little blood. There's been a little damage, right? To that um, oral mucosa. So what can happen and happens to people that even brush their teeth probably three or four times a day and have wonderful, beautiful teeth is that a minority of bacteria in their mouth get into their bloodstream. Guess what? You have an immune system. You have a spleen that's a very good filter. You have a liver. We have, our body is ready for that in most cases and your body will clear that. But some bacteria do get into your bloodstream. And one thought through some model system experiments that we've done with Gilly Bachrock's lab is that maybe some fuso gets into the bloodstream and ends up in your emerging colonic tumor. So Gilly and I debate and argue about the way. Is it that you swallow some fuso and it goes all the way down, it survives the acid of the stomach, it survives the detergents of the small bowel and it ends up in the colon possible? Is it possible that you have some damage in your oral mucosa with brushing and whatever else? Maybe you eat something sharp and it gets into your bloodstream and ends up in the colon? It's possible. Can we ask questions like this in, in mice and other model systems? We can, but, but why does it, why does it, how does it stay in the colon, right? So one thing is these sticky proteins. So there are sugar molecules, if you will, on the lining tissues and cells, the epithelial cells of your colon that change as a cancer develops. So the pattern of sugar molecules expressed by a colonic epithelial cell that's dysplastic or neoplastic and cancerous is different from a healthy epithelial pattern of yeah. glycogen. And Fuso has proteins that bind sugars. And guess what? Some of those sugars are similar between mouth bacteria that Fusobacterium nucleatum likes to bind and dysplastic and neoplastic epithelial cells. So one thought is that Fuso's adhesin proteins bind molecules on epithelial cells. And that's what allows Fuso not only to sort of transit through regardless if you're a bloodstream believer or a saliva dripping down, you know, a believer, but enables it to stick. And once it sticks, you know, just like we need certain things to live in a home, obviously, maybe a little heat. If you live in a cold, you know, climate, you need food. Fuso has some adaptations or metabolic features that allow it to live in the colon. Okay. Right. It's got some metabolic specializations that enable it to find some carbon sources that it needs to grow um, when it's mucosal associated. And so maybe that's why it does it and other mouth bacteria uh, don't. But I will tell you that there is a strong mouth oral microbial signature in a lot of human colonic adenomas and colorectal cancer. Yeah. There are other mouth bugs there besides Fuso. 
Wow. And yeah. I, I know there's there's similar kind of evidence for um, cardiovascular disease as well. People kind of have hypothesized the same thing that there's bacteria coming from from the mouth. So all of this research we do into the gut microbiome, maybe we should be all become oral microbiologists instead and, and start looking at, at those pathways. So they're saying- a wonderful group of people. Yeah. So yeah it's a wonderful field. So I agree. More oral microbiology. <laughs> That'd be great. So once these bacteria, whether it's uh, this fuso or whether it's the strep species that you say get down. So, I mean, what is it doing? It's in the gut and, and how is it interacting with the immune system or with those cells? And, and why is it then making them, you know, become cancerous or, or what the kind of process is there? I know you've done a lot of immunology in this work, uh, in this field. Um, and and sure. what is it doing? Okay, so first we'll take, there are two different ways you could think about it. You could think about how it's interacting with the immune cells and the stromal cells within an evolving tumor microenvironment. And you could think about what's it doing with the, the cell that is becoming cancerous. So I love immunology, so we'll start with the immune system. So there are a whole bunch of scientists, not just me and my lab that have studied this. So Fuso is interacting with a lot of immune cells. So one, um, one story or manuscript that I was involved in, again, involved um, some scientists in Israel, Ophir Mandelbaum's lab, and also Gilad Bachrach's lab, and my lab too. And what we found within the tumor microenvironment, Fuso is interacting with cells that express a molecule called TIGET that is an immune checkpoint molecule or protein. And it's normal for immune cells to have these. Immune cells, like all the cells that our body need brakes, just like our cars need brakes or our yeah. bicycles need brakes, okay? So there's nothing bad about necessarily or biologically about having an immune checkpoint or a break on an immune, on an immune cell. So, but what <laughs> Fuso does is on cells that are really important for anti-tumor immunity, like natural killer and K cells, Fuso has an adhesin protein called FAP2 that binds one of these immune checkpoint cells on uh, immune checkpoint proteins on a really important anti-tumor immune cell. So different T cells and NK cells um, express this TIGET molecule and Fuso binds that immune checkpoint protein and engages it, engages signaling. So it's important not only to bind something, but if it's a protein that delivers a signal inside the cell, it sort of does both those things. So that's not a trivial distinction because um, you can think of activating and, and blocking proteins yeah. when you bind. Okay. Wait. So when it does that, it sort of makes the natural killer cell a less good killer. And that isn't good in the tumor microenvironment. Mm. You want your immune cells killing those cancer cells and keeping that tumor in check or making it shrink away. So why would a bacteria do that? Does it wanna drive cancer? No, it probably wants to evade the immune system yeah. itself. It doesn't wanna get killed by the immune system itself, right? Yeah. So Fuso does a lot of interesting things. It also brings in myeloid cells and molecules that Fuso induces seem to make the myeloid cells less activating of immune cells that then kill tumors. So it's engaging with lots of myeloid cells like dendritic cells and macrophages and myeloid derived suppressor cells and neutrophils. And it's sort of changing their behavior. And then it also has pro a protein that makes certain lymphocytes, innate and adaptive ones, not kill because it's putting the brakes on them or not gen if they aren't directly killer cells, it's sort of impairing their ability to productively participate in anti-tumor immunity. Wow. So, whoa, not good, right? Not good. You guys are doing that. Not Get it good. out of there. Well, wow. that's, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Hey, so it kind of, the, it, what this reminds me of, I suppose, what I might remind other people of who know the field is the H. pylori story where H. pylori, Helicolactobacter pylori is found in the stomach and you know, it was first identified by um, Marshall and Warren. They won the Nobel Prize for it, and it um, shows that this bacteria led to stomach ulcers. Um, and so the standard treatment now is to um, give antibiotics for to, to get rid of that, even though H. pylori might have some advantages uh, in, in certain yeah. situations. 
So what is the current thinking that for, for Fuso bacteria? Should we be getting rid of it? Is there specific treatments for Fuso? Should it just be targeted in, in people who are already cancerous? Or, or what are the kind of thoughts around that in terms of getting rid of it or managing it? Such a good question. And there's so many things to be learned from knowing about other bugs like Helicobacter pylori. So what is pathogenic or tumor driving or eliciting or inflammation driving or eliciting about H. pylori? Well, we know about CAG A. What do we know about Fuso? Not enough. So what is sort of the bad actor in terms of, of us human? The other thing that you mentioned sort of in passing is that Fuso, uh, the presence of Helicobacter pylori might increase our risk of ulcers and gastric cancer, but guess what? Maybe having it as protective for something else. And maybe that's telling us not all Helicobacter pylori are created equally genomically or in terms of features that they have. 100% true, won't go into that, but beautiful literature. Same thing for Fuso. There's a huge world within world of different Fusobacterium species. And uh, genetic differences between them. So we need to better understand what Fuso is doing and what Fusos are not a problem and which Fusos are a problem for different individuals. Yeah. And then what do we do? Do we just give broad spectrum antibiotics? It's actually often a cocktail for Helicobacter pylori. Mm -hmm. And Helicobacter is so, oh, so wonderfully complex. So there are actual tumors, mucosal associated lymphoid tumors, gastric malts, where you can cure the patient sometimes by giving them uh, antibiotics to target Helicobacter pylori. But that's a, a small minority of patients, okay? What we're learning or what we've learned incidentally is there are antibiotics that kill Fusobacterium in the clinical lab, right? That clear infections with Fusobacterium nucleatum that definitely do happen clinically, right? But they're not necessarily specific. They're not targeted. They won't just knock down Fuso levels. They'll hit many bacteria that mm -hmm. might be beneficial to a, to a human, okay? Or any other animal. So what we need is more targeted, right? Approaches mm -hmm. and Part of targeted approaches are, you know, doing nice, really careful drug screens because maybe we can find something specific. Um, but it's also thinking about antivirulence approaches. What is virulent about Fuso? What is the problem with Fuso? So I mentioned one adhesin. Do we somehow need to target this adhesin? Or there's out of the box thinking. Fuso has features that enables it to get to a tumor microenvironment. Do we want to engineer a Fuso that uh, has the feature to get to a tumor but then deliver something beneficial? So while there are antibiotics that exist on the shelf in our clinical armamentarium that will kill Fusonucleatum strains and strains that have been isolated from human tumors, they affect many things. Are there opportunities for the development of selective antibiotics through different screens? Most definitely. Are there opportunities for more sophisticated approaches that target virulence features? Yes, our group's working on it 100%. And of course, there are lots of other interesting, right, strategies uh, for targeting different bacteria. So um, I have talked to different companies that are using phage-based therapeutics, and there yeah. are several. And then I have a fun project with a brilliant scientist in Canada, Emma Allen Verco, looking at Delo Vibrio associated like organisms, which we sort of call by an acronym, BALOs, and you can grow and train them to select of their bacteria that eat other bacteria. And they have these cool sort of predator prey relationships Amazing, yeah. and you can grow and train some of these balos to eat other bacteria like fusos right. and it's very specific interaction these balos develop a very specific taste for a particular e coli or a particular fuso so there are a whole gamut of strategies right uh, so it sounds like there could be yeah lots of strategies or treatments in the future for uh <laughs> for targeting Fuso. And I think you're right. It, it could be that there are different types of Fuso which are, are doing different things. But the other, I suppose, hypothesis is that Fuso only becomes disease causing because of something that's happening in the environment. And I think 
one of my kind of favorite kind of environmental examples about that is this pine beetle in, in forests, especially up in northern Canada. And the pine beetle is a normal part of the environment, you know, can live happily. But then with a change in kind of global warming, an increase in pressure, it then can, you know, expand, well, not expand, but, uh, you know, grow more and and um, and it kills a lot of these uh, these trees that it, it lives in. So could this be what's happening with Fusa? Is it something that's happening in the environment that makes it become um, disease causing and um, carcinogenic? Is it something, I don't know, dietary or is it something lifestyle that triggers it to then cause these problems in the gut? I love that idea. So I'm really fortunate to collaborate with a lot of nutritional epidemiologists at the Harvard School of Public Health and also um, epidemiologists and clinician scientists at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And they're asking just those kinds of questions. And so they start out by looking for patterns in big data sets and large cohort studies and asking like that, are there patterns in the diet where you're more likely to have fuso in your tumor? And there seem to be those associations, right? And so that identifications of those correlations or patterns is really, really, really um, important. And it's the first step, right? And ultimately we wanna to evolve to sort of the gold standard of clinical care where wouldn't it be great if we could do a clinical trial and do a prospective cohort clinical trial where we could design sort of a, you know, this is very dreamy blue sky kind of science, you know, an ideal dietary pattern for you or selective intervention that if goodness forbid you were at high risk because you had had a polyp, that we could do something for you or a group of yous or a group of people, right? where we could then lower your risk of a second polyp or, or developing frank colorectal cancer. And um, even without thinking about the microbiome, you know, there are beautiful associations with certain lifestyle choices about exercise or certain changes in dietary patterns um, correlate with better outcomes and better survival. Yeah. And when you look at those data, why? Is it maybe the microbiome? So can you have an observation about a certain behavior like biking to work? <laughs> I'm just picking something, you know, out of the hat and, you know, just somehow it affects. So we don't know. We, there are some, there are a few papers that correlate certain features of a dietary pattern in these large cohorts and maybe having more or less fuso in a tumor. And that's provocative, but again, you, that's a great observation, but then you have to push it forward, push it forward and get it mechanism. Yeah. And you have to get the mechanism. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of, a lot of what we know from that nutritional epidemiology would suggest that maybe there is a microbiome link because there's studies showing that people who eat more fiber, for example, are, are less risk of colorectal cancer. And of course, fiber is this food for the microbiome. So maybe it's these, you know, metabolites that the microbes are producing that, that kind of keeps everything in check. Um, but there's examples again from cardiovascular disease. There's this, you know, TMAO is this famous metabolite now, which is produced through the metabolism by the microbes, which then contributes to cardiovascular disease. So I guess that is what your colleagues and you might find out with some of your kind of nutrition work in the future, that, uh, that maybe the microbiome is kind of interacting with the diet in some way to affect colorectal cancer risk. We love doing those kinds of studies uh, in my lab. We love looking at a microbial metabolite, be it TMAO or short chain fatty acids that are positively or negatively associated with the disease state in humans, and then trying to nail the biology looking at that microbial enzyme, looking how a perturbation can change it in a more simplified host than a human, like a mouse, where we control the microbiome using notobiotics. Um, but that's where real preclinical systems allow you to unpack the biology. Even when we have these really beautiful associations and good preclinical studies around TMAO, there is still so much to understand about how a metabolite can contribute to vascular disease or chronic kidney disease um, and how the microbiome and diet slot into that. Yeah, because it's usually not a simple pathway. You know, there's so many microbes, so many metabolites that although you can pick out one little pathway, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of things going on. But if we're going to kind of finish off maybe and talk uh, about treatments, one of the biggest kind of developments in cancer treatment in the last few years um, is the kind of checkpoint inhibitor treatments. And, and these people won the, the Nobel Prize for a couple of years ago. And you mentioned these checkpoint inhibitors already, where these, um, one of them is called PD-1, uh, one of these checkpoints. And if you block that, uh, it's a, a very useful way of allowing the immune system to fight off cancer. And it's been shown to be very useful in certain cancers. Um, and might be useful for, for colorectal cancer. 
some really interesting research has shown that the microbiome may be involved in that. And you've spoken a little bit about it. So maybe you can talk a little bit more. What is the future for that? Or how could the microbiome, you know, help with these treatments? Or how can we kind of study them in tandem to maybe improve these really promising treatments for um, colorectal cancer? Yeah, so this is an area of research really near and dear to my heart. My lab works in this field. Uh, and there have been some lovely studies from Jennifer Wargo's lab, from Tom Gajewski's lab, from Laurent Zidvogel's lab. And one challenge is they've all found something a little bit different. And it's not because they're studying different cancers. Um, there are really interesting signals about whether a, pa a patient is going to respond to, as you said, one of the point in if they're not, and it can be regardless of whether they have renal cancer or lung cancer or melanoma. So within single centers, there have been shared observations about different cancers. So I think there is tremendous opportunity uh, because really the crux of all those observations um, goes back to sort of that eco evo think that you were alluding to when you mentioned the pine, you know, the pine beetle, right? That the immune system and the microbiome have co-evolved and co-adapted. And if we understand how the immune system integrates and takes in all the collective signals of a particular microbiome and how the microbiome shapes immune system development at a really basic level, how it's integrating all these signals and how that leads to the development of different cellular states, cell types, cell numbers of the immune system, maybe we can begin to tune that system mm. to make things like immunotherapy for cancer work, but also help people with inflammatory and autoimmune disorders. Yeah. So I'm very, very interested in that field. I'm interested in that idea from epidemiology of meta-analysis. Let's get all these data together across studies and let's analyze these microbiome data and see if we can see conserved signatures. And, and my lab and others are seeing features, metabolic features that are common, right? It might not be a taxa, a bug that I have and you have and 30 other people have that help them uh, respond. It might not be, it could be to um, PT, PD-1 therapeutics. It might be a metabolic pathway that's engaged by many bacteria that we just have to tickle or tune just the right way because then that gives the right sort of series of metabolic inputs to immune cells to help immunotherapy work better. Yeah, that'd be exciting. Well, there was a, a fascinating small study that came out, I think the week, a week or two ago, which showed that a fecal transplant in certain patients may improve their response to this um, checkpoint inhibitor therapy for, for cancer. So do you see that as a kind of treatment? Is everyone who's going to be getting one of these treatments also going to get an FMT as well to try and improve their response? Or is the future, you know, targeted probiotics with your cancer therapy or, or something along those lines, which could help? But what do you see as the future of, of this field? So really interesting paper about FMT and melanoma out of Israel. Very provocative. I think it tells us there's a signal there and we need to go after and refine and, uh, come up with a therapy that is perhaps more targeted uh, and that we can deliver and deploy to implement to more patients. Uh, so find something that's a more scalable solution uh, and also be mindful of how we can do it in a, in a safe way too mm. um, and deliver it to as many people and make it effective for as many people as, as possible. Great. So I think there are many possible, uh, I'll speculate, many possible alternative <laughs> futures. Maybe it's a defined consortium of bacteria. Maybe it's some small molecules. Maybe it's a combination of small molecules or foods, uh, foods for the bacteria, right? Delivered mm. with a consortium of bacteria. And maybe it's not a one size fits all option. You know, maybe it's a couple different ideas that are pushed forward. And by profiling someone's microbiome, we can figure out what's going to be the, the sort of best fit for them in terms of their um, outcome, in terms of their survival, progression-free survival, over, overall survival, and maybe even um, stable disease or cure. So thanks for listening to the Biomes podcast, sponsored by Microbiome Insights. My name is Dr. Ruri Robertson. Tune in next time for some more exciting insights into the latest developments in the human microbiome.